After several months of quality time with the 14 gallon Brewbilt X2, posting a number of videos about it and having used it a couple times to ferment in, it's finally time for me to share with you my opinions and thoughts on this product. Stick around if you wanna see more. Hey everyone, welcome back. Larry here again to share with you my thoughts about my experience with the Brewbilt 14 gallon X2, right here to my right, your left. I did a previous video on the features that it comes with a number of months back. If you've missed that, go check that out after this video. The point of this video is to tell you what I actually finally think about this after having used it a couple times. Full disclosure here, this was sent to me free of charge by more beer to get it in front of you, my viewers, right? I did not pay for this, not one penny. However, I've made no promises to say anything they want me to say. What I'm saying in this video is completely my opinions and you'll see why in a little bit. So I did brew a couple of beers on this, starting back in February. I brewed a Vienna lager on this thing, uh, did it under pressure, didn't have to. It was actually cold enough in my garage here in the winter time. I did not need any way to chill it. It was already plenty cold in here. In fact, I actually had to heat my garage to keep it warm, which actually kind of didn't help the testing out of the, of the jacketed side of the conical here, right? Which is what a big feature of this jacketed conical is. It is got the whole jacket around the outside to help with the chilling along paired with a Ice Master Max 2, which they also sent to me as well. My second beer is an American Light Lager, which I actually just kegged recently. And they actually did ferment in a warmer environment, took advantage of the chilling jacket to keep it within range. So I got a couple beers under my belt on this thing already. And I think I have enough information and, and personal opinions to give to you what I think about the product. So the thing I liked the most, the thing that actually appealed to me about this product was that it came with this cooling jacket again, that's kind of built in here, uh, right? And, and I had to give the cooling jacket a try, right? It worked great. Uh, brew days, chilling down with my immersion chiller was uh, pretty good, but it's always that last uh, several, maybe five to 10 degrees, which make it hard to get down to. You generally go through a lot of water with immersion chillers or any chiller really trying to get down to your pitching temperatures. Well, with this thing was kind of nice that I could actually get it down to a reasonable temperature, say under hundred degrees, uh, rack it right to here and use the chilling jacket to chill it the rest of the way down to the pitching temperature in just, uh, well, uh, maybe a couple hours. So that was nice. Plus it helped maintain temperature. And uh, as this garage got hot, I was able to keep it down in the 50 degree range or Vienna had a different range than the light beer, but either way, I was able to keep it in that range with the cooling jacket and that was awesome. And is the biggest reason why you would wanna get this device. And all the ports that come on here were really good for flexibility. You can do a variety of things like I showed in that earlier video, attachments galore, move things around, try different things. And so that's always a nice thing to have uh, options, right? And one of the options was, well, how do you rack your beer out of the fermenter into your keg? Well, there's a few ways to do it with this device. The easiest, in my opinion, was to use the floating dip tube and the ball lock posts with the pressure kit. That's how I do it with my other fermenters already, and that's what I was used to doing, and it works great. And using that method, there was never any need to dump any trube in order to get access to the clear beer because you were racking right off the top. So that worked good, right? But another option is to attach a butterfly valve to one of the ports on the cone. It's a good backup option if your ball lock posts are clogged, which happens sometimes with certain beer styles. If you do a lot of dry hops or fruit beer additions, those uh, floating dip tubes in the ball lock posts get clogged really easily. <laughs> I know from experience. And feeling that, you can use the, the sample valve with a probably a half inch ID tubing. You can probably rack right out there with gravity, right? or ultimately use the dump valve at the very bottom. I used a couple different spunning valves, uh, one from another manufacturer, Spike, which I've had on hand for my first batch, which worked great, but they also, uh, Morebeer had sent me their pressure version of this, and it's a much bigger spunning valve kit than, than the Spike, right? It has uh, multiple PRVs built into this, one on the lid, of course, one on the pressure relief valve itself at the top and the side, so it's just very heavy duty. One of the things I really loved about the jacketed conical is that the hookup hoses that, uh, that hook up to the side of this thing, connect and disconnect without any loss of fluids. They join, you can unhook them, and you don't lose anything except for maybe a drop that may have been inside the uh, connection at, at the time, but really uh, it doesn't spill the glycol coolant all over the floor or you have to cap it in any other way. So that was a really nice thing. It was easy to clean, no cooling coils to have to wipe all the coils down. It's just basically an open fermenter once you remove the top lid, easy to wipe down, really easy to clean. But that's about, in my opinion, where the advantages end. I've had a number of issues along the way with this system that I've documented uh, for both my batches of beer, had similar issues both times. 
And I gotta share them with you so you know what you're getting yourself into. One of the minor things that bothered me uh, a little bit when I was assembling this thing is that the this neoprene uh, sleeve jacket that goes over the device uh, wasn't really well fitted at all for the 14 gallon size at least. I actually had to trim off uh, a, a fair amount of the foam and fabric in order to get it around all the geometry around this thing so it would actually fit on and uh, stamp together or actually Velcro together. And that's not a major thing. It was just one of those things that you have a new product and a new uh, sleeve for it. You put it on and it doesn't fit. So, you know, I had to trim around it and get it put together. And and it was it was a minor annoyance, but um, it shouldn't have been a problem from the start, right? And another accessory that came with this was that flex chamber device that fits underneath the uh, dump valve to, to collect tube and yeast and, and the like, right? I could never actually get it to seal right. Uh, I've used it twice in two fermentations and even with some test uh, water trying to debug the problem and at no time was I able to maintain a successful seal even after I thought it was sealed. I went uh, I went in the house overnight after I wrecked it from the, ke uh, from the kettle into the fermenter, put everything together, hooked it all up, went to bed. The next morning I had a puddle underneath uh, on the floor underneath this thing because it was dripping. So I don't think I'm ever going to use this uh, flux chamber at all, honestly. In my first video on this, I talked about how great it is to have a four-legged fermenter versus a three-leg, and I still feel that way uh, still today, but uh, there was a downside to it, right? Because with four legs uh, underneath the same fermenter, there's a lot less room to get any kind of uh, spill bucket or pouring container in underneath for, for the dump valve to drain into. And I struggled a little bit finding the right kind of container to fit under there to like collect the tube. Uh, I'm the kind of person who doesn't have any of the advanced uh, elbows and plumbing to, to like change the direction of the flow outwards. And even if I did, it would be completely useless because this thing actually, although it's on a table now, would actually be on my garage floor. And where was that going to go? It's out under my garage floor, right? I, I needed to dump it into a container. So, um, so with what I had, it didn't work so well. It worked, but it was kind of a struggle getting my little container in and out from underneath this thing. And, um, that was a little bit of a disappointment, but like I said, I don't plan on doing any real dumping anyway with this thing ever. So uh, it's not a concern for me, but just to let you know, it'll be a bit of a tight space to work in. But the biggest problem I had with uh, the X2 was its inability to hold pressure, right? So all the other things were just minor annoyances, things that you just deal with. It's just how all products can be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. When it came to the pressure sealing though, it was a major disappointment because um, this thing has been marketed as a unitank. And to me, to, to any definition you can probably find online, uh, it's a conical, it's a, it's a unitank conical or a conical unitank, right? And they are not the same thing. A conical is, uh, well, it's got a conical shape at the bottom. It's got a cone and everything like that, right? A unitank is also uh, that as well as the ability to uh, logger in, carbonate in, right, even, or even serve from. Well, if it can't hold the pressures required to carbonate and to serve or, or bulk age from without air getting in over time, then it's not really a unitank in my opinion, uh, but it is a fine conical. Uh, the issues I had were really a, mainly around the V band clamp that goes around this thing. Uh, my, I went through several clamps. I went through a lid replacement. I actually had to modify a clamp. I had to cut a piece off. I did small little video posts on social media about this as it went along. I got it to the point where it can hold around eight to nine PSI, which is maybe you know, rolling the dice that it can because there's no guarantee if you clamp it on, it'll hold it the next time. It's kind of unreliable in that way. I've done a number of tests with, uh, with not just with the beer, but also with water and, and time and, and measurements and, and patience and uh, can never really reliably to get it to hold pressure every single time. Um, but I did get it to hold up to about eight or nine PSI um, on occasion, more often than not, let's say, which was a good sign, promising sign, better than the one or two PSI I was getting originally. That required me to keep having to add CO2 to the tank as it was fermenting in my first batch, just to keep the air from getting in. And uh, I think it's a combination of two things. I think that it's, uh, it's definitely a quality control issue, a manufacturing quality issue, because I tried several clamps now that they sent me. Some work better than others. So there is some kind of variability there. 
But also, I think it's a poor design choice to use V-band clamps on, on fermenters. I mean, they're not designed for an application like this. They're designed for joining solid angled flange pipes, which are meant to seal by compression by tightening these V-clamps and the pipes come tighter and tighter together. There is no solid material here. These are two formed sheet metal, very thin sheet metal parts, the lid and the body, and you're trying to join them with a V-clamp not designed for such an application. So I'm not surprised that there's problems with it, but uh, I'm told by Brewbuilt they're working on a, another clamp, uh, either a supplier or another variation of the clamp to make it better. So there's that to look forward to. Um, you know, if, if you're going to order one, inquire about the V-clamps. So I hope that information is useful to you to decide whether or not you want to get one for yourself. Any questions, comment down below in the comment section, and I'll talk to you later.